I want to first thank you for uh, attending this. I, I thought it, the only uh, people were going to be here were the cleaning crew since I was the last speaker of, uh, of the series. Uh, what I'll like to present in the next 40 to 45 minutes is uh, a basic review for some of the people who were not here attending the previous sessions on what Micropulse is and its current clinical uses as well as some of the research protocols that are coming down the pipeline with this uh, exciting new therapy. Uh, here's the usual FDA status disclaimer, please don't try this at home and if you do don't mention my name. Uh, I'm also, uh, though my financial disclosure, I am a uh, paid consultant for Aerodex as well as QLT. So the summary, the outline of my talk will be in three sections. First of all, what is Micropulse Laser? What are the clinical uses of MPLT, Micropulse Laser Therapy? And we'll discuss each of these disease conditions uh, and I will only just mention glaucoma since much more experienced and better speakers in the past few sessions have explained its use in that. And how is it, uh, more importantly, integrated into current uh, clinical practice? And usually my sessions are informal too, so if you want to ask a question, please put up your hand, throw a shoe at me or something, get my attention, and we'll go from there. Okay, what is Micropulse Laser? The, probably the best impetus for driving uh, uh, people to consider subthreshold and more specifically Micropulse is the first rule of medicine, right? First, do no harm. Uh, anybody can set up a laser system to do photocoagulation and so forth, but the push was, let's see if we can try to get the same clinical endpoint without the collateral damage that's induced by photocoagulation. This started beginning in even the early 80s. I think probably everybody in this audience has tinkered or tampered with what was considered subthreshold uh, laser photocoagulation. So we know in terms of profile, if you look at a continuous wave or CW laser burn, there's not only photocoagulative damage to the tissue at the center spot or the visible endpoint, but also in the penumbra or the areas around it, there is further tissue destruction. Now, the, the, uh, that is the standard understanding of what happens with continuous wave laser uh, on tissues. And naturally, concomitant with that is some of the complications. So you have anterior segment complications like corneal, iridial, and lens burns, Choroidal neovascularization, especially early on, we've all seen complications of this, especially when you break Brooks membrane, when they're very intense, short, high energy shots. And of course, the visual prognosis is poor, especially as they come closer to the fovea. Also, also foveal uh, uh, photocoagulation, big risk. Um, foveal shutdown, especially in ischemic cases, all right, where there's extensive damage to the perifoveal capillaries, not uncommon. Also, you see, especially in diabetics, epiretinal membrane formation, choroidal hemorrhages, atrophy with scar expansion, and there are cases I'm going to show you uh, that illustrate that very well. And of course, avascular submacular fibrosis, particularly in patients who have had very extensive and diffuse DME. Here's a classic slide set that probably all of you are familiar. This is straight from the ETDRS showing a classical case of clinically significant macular edema with a ring of hard exudates uh, coming right through uh, to the uh, foveal center, okay? And here is, by the book, recommended focal laser photocoagulation to the leaking microaneurysms. Okay, this is on par. And here's the result. Great, you have disappearance of the hard exudates, but guess what? You have this little island here, which the, is visually significant and the patient will ensure that they remind you of that for the rest of their life. So even with the modified ETDRS protocol, there is still visible evidence of uh, photocoagulative pigmentary changes occurring at the, in the outer retina and the RPE. Here's a case I've included, and this is the first time I'm presenting, it's one of the patients about four years ago, well, before we had Micropulse, before I had the Micropulse laser, who uh, received using the Iridex green laser, 532 uh, nanometers, 200 large spot size, 50 milliwatts, the lowest setting you can put on, and 30 millisecond duration, the lowest duration you can set on. And here's the treatment, and if you look carefully, I don't know if you can see that there has been some resolution, but you can still see the peppering, the pigmentary changes occurring at that. And more importantly, it was visually significant to the patient. And so he, every time he comes in, he still reminds me, he said, yeah, I still see these buckshots, Dr. Mansour. Uh, so that's one of the things that we've 
all had an experience with, with continuous wave. So Micropulse simply understood, if you look at the slide on the left for continuous wave, you have a fixed amount of energy delivered continuously for a set time. If you're able to chop that up or break it up to large intervals of off and short periods when that laser's on, you get that micropulsing. So what's the big deal with it? What does it achieve? If you look at the temperature uh, uh, effects, the, temp the tissue temperature gradient, is you get with continuous wave this exponential rise well beyond the threshold for photocoagulative damage and as soon as it's off there's an exponential decay in the temperature. By chopping that laser, the tissue, if you control it right, does not reach that threshold for photocoagulation. It quickly cools off. So you allow this cooling period for the uh, tissues. Currently, as you know, there's three on the market, different wavelengths, 810, 577, 532. My experience, clinical experience, uh, for the past year and a half has been with the 577, or the yellow, the IQ 577. And the reason, the reason it, it is advantageous, at least in my view, is you have the peak absorption uh, at the, uh, uh, with using the, uh, by the oxyhemoglobin occurs at 577. It's excellent lesion visibility, low intraocular light scattering, reduced pain, and neg negligible xanthophyll absorption, so work through the fovea is even safer, and high choriocapillaris absorption, therefore more uniform effects of results in patients of different pigment uh, degrees and, and their fundi. So mechanism of action. The standard use and understanding of continuous wave laser photocoagulation is that of protein denatura denaturation and tissue coagulation. Focal, particularly employed in terms of direct closure of the vessels, either by heat-induced contraction of the vessel wall or inducing an endovascular thrombosis. Okay? That's kind of what we uh, expect with the continuous wave. In grid photocoagulation, there's a couple of things going on. One, of course, is the destruction of the high oxygen-consuming uh, outer photoreceptors, which leads to increased inner retinal oxygenation, reduced blood flow, and therefore decreased retinal vascular leakage. That's one mechanism. The other, an interesting mechanism, which now we are starting to pay more attention to, is induced proliferation of vascular endothelial cells. Okay, the ones that used to get knocked off uh, are now being rejuvenated. And we believe it's not only a direct effect, but also an RPE factor that's being released to sustain them. And therefore, restoration of the inner blood retinal barrier. Other things that we need that have also been postulated to occur with great photocoagulation is destruction of the outer retinal la layers and therefore the RPE permits better diffusion uh, of oxygen from the choriocapillaris, debridement of sick or fatigued RPE cells, enhancement of outer blood, which leads to enhancement of outer blood retinal barrier, alteration in the outer blood retinal barrier may favor movement of fluid from the retina into the choroid, and reduce total surface area of abnormal vessels, therefore reducing the amount of leakage, which is felt to be a minor effect. The last factor is now, again, as I mentioned, more attention is being paid off to this indirect effect. And that is the stimulation of the RPE to release certain biochemical mediators and factors that antagonize not only VEGF, but other uh, pro-vascular uh, leakage elements. Other things have already been identified in the literature uh, some of the effects of laser on the RPE, and it doesn't only include continuous wave, some of it has related to PDT or photodynamic therapy, but we know there's upregulation up of inhibitors and downregulations of inducers of VEGF-related angiogenesis, downregulation of ma matrix metalloprotein uh, proteinases, as well as upregulation of MPS inhibitors, which uh, subsequently leads to inhib inhibiting and initiation of angiogenesis. So these are other important factors already been identified in the literature, the cause of effects on RPE. Also stem cell migration and restoration of uh, injured dys dysfunctional cells, induction of RP apoptosis and increased choroidal heat shock proteins, and also upregulation of PEDF. So if you look at schematically, what does a conventional classic continuous wave laser achieve is you have this uh, inner area where there is photo destruction, okay, which is the directly a response of that heated tissue. Then you have this indirectly heated tissue where the tissue remains viable and able to produce a stress response. And that is 
the kind of uh, holy grail, that is the one area that we all agree is the area that something is going on there that's causing resolution of the pathology. Modified Clarisic or the modified ETDRS protocol still results in a uh, lighter, but albeit still photocoagulative damage in the center, which is the directly heated tissue, and then you still have that indirectly heated uh, tissue or treated tissue which is responsible for the beneficial effect. And that's what the interesting thing with Micropulse the goal was I don't want any photocoagulative tissue destruction. I want to generate as much of this uh, indirectly uh, uh, altered tissue to release the biochemical factors uh, that will help in inhibiting the angiogenesis and the leakage. Here is a chart to summarize just briefly in the early days of looking at duty cycle. In other words, the frequency of the on versus off uh, chop of that laser and looking at ophthalmoscopic evidence of tissue damage, FA evidence of tissue damage, and fundus autofluorescence. We can probably start adding a third column of looking at spectral domain OCT to show that as you reduce the duty cycle, you go from 100% continuous wave to 50% micropulse to 10 to 15 to 5%, you start seeing less and less to no evidence of any uh, tissue damage. Uh, Jeff Luttrell probably has the largest experience with the 810 and has published already uh, back in last year a series of looking at what happens when you use 10 to 15% duty cycle, what's DC, okay, the frequency of laser induced retinal damage still low, definitely low compared to continuous wave, but then um, when you reduce that further to 5% duty cycle, there's zero. And so that is for our standard recommendation for macular work that we still keep it at 5% duty cycle. We don't recommend going to the higher duty cycles. And uh, Vajosevic also showed something interesting, which is now getting a lot of airplay recently. Because what we used to guide success is visual acuity and retinal thickness on OCT. Well, there's another added dimension which is not available to all of us, and that's microperimetry and retinal sensitivity. Uh, we know, for example, certain uh, pharmacological agents actually reduce retinal sensitivity, even though clinically you look at the OCT and it looks great, and you're scratching your head and say, why isn't the patient seeing as well? Classic case is triamcinolone. So he showed that compared to the modified ETDRS protocol, the modified ETDRS protocol resulted in reduced retinal sensitivity and the micropulse in increased retinal sensitivity. So this is one of those kind of, wow, uh, you know, we never talked about line gainers in AMD therapy for years until the anti-VEGF uh, showed up on the scene. And this is what, one of the things that excited me about it is that we can actually see increased retinal sensitivity with this. Levinsky also reported a, pros a, a prospective double mass control trial on 123 eyes, and basically can be summarized that if all the, the gains in letters the micropulse high density, not micropulse low density, or compared to the modified ETRS, significantly higher in terms of the gain of letters. And that's what a lot of us who have used it, who skeptically got into this, actually start seeing. Okay, uh, any questions so far before I go on to the next section? Right. I want to discuss now uh, the disease conditions. Okay, diabetic retinopathy. There's several ways we use micropulse uh, uh, phototherapy Focal, grid, combined focal and grid, which is probably the most common, and I, a lot of us who uh, have been using Micropulse for some time are actually doing less focal and moving on to more grid uh, treatment. And then, of course, scatter PRP for proliferative uh, diabetic retinopathy. This was one of my first cases uh, where I was using homeopathic doses because I was very afraid of this, and especially when you get used to you know, 200 milliwatts and using that close to the fovea. Uh, diabetic patient, was uh, had uh, central involvement 20 30 minus one and then within about you know just under shy of two months single treatment no pharmacotherapy improved to 20 20 minus two and you can see already and again i apologize this is just one of the there's a lot of hard exudates here but they're almost all gone okay here's another case uh, a different patient who had pre a series of Avastin injections and reached a kind of a threshold which a lot of us have experienced where no matter how much you inject them, inject them there's still that persistent uh, edema. And so um, 
had a single session of MPLT and uh, vision within two months improved to 2025 20, minus two. And if you look at the same patient's OCT, again, went from uh, this appearance, again, sorry, where you even had not only cystoid uh, spaces in the retina, but also sub subretinal fluid to uh, amazing normalization. And that's what really got me excited about this, uh, uh, this uh, treatment. Here's another case, uh, multiple, multiple sessions of Vivastin, again, uh, type two diabetic, uh, lots of heart exudates, visual acuity was 20 over 80, despite you look over here and say, well, you know, it's not too bad. But what's interesting, even though the visual gain was not dramatic, there was a significant reduction in the thickness, but if you look, there was a lot of clearing of the heart exudate even within a month and a half. And I've seen, we've, a lot of us who've used the yellow, the 577, the, even the green, have seen that, which is an interesting effect. We don't know, you know, uh, uh, you don't usually see clearing of the uh, heart exudates that rapid. Here is another case, uh, much more severe uh, situation, multiple, multiple Avastin injections. And uh, the patient went from 2100, again, single session of MPLT, to 2060 in 74 days with significant reduction. Still, there was some residual effect, but this is after one session of MPLT. Um, here is the uh, OCT of uh, uh, the patient who had not only a Vastin but triamcinolone. This is two months at the end. The, this, the upper photo shows two months at the end of the combined therapy, and the vision was still 20 over 80. Single session of MPLT. At that point, I started cranking up to the powers that I'm using now uh, and the parameters I'm using now. Uh, it took a while, but they reached 2030. No injections in the intervening period. So, in general, the, the, the studies so far uh, looking at PRP now, treatment, not for DME, but PRP treatment, using the A10 showed that the results are comparable to standard PRP. The response, however, is uh, a little bit more slow. That may not be a bad thing, especially if there's a lot of uh, extra retinal or fibrovascular uh, tissue, so you don't see the same vigorous induction uh, of membrane formation as you do with some of the anti-VEGF or the very wall-to-wall uh, -wall PRP treatments that we used to do. It's particularly useful, uh, therefore, for patients who have active NVE, uh, and especially that you can start to look at using this, and I've started doing for the severe or very severe NPDR cases. Um, a lot of us who kind of drag our feet on using PRP for some of the severe NPDR or very severe NPDR, or we uh, now move to, we include those patients more readily. There's also a protocol, a three zone protocol that we are uh, submitting to uh, George Washington University, uh, looking at the 577 in what we call a three zone uh, protocol where the, uh, the retina is divided into three zones uh, and different parameters are applied of micropulse, so zone one, which is the more central, using a 5% duty cycle and a low uh, power range uh, is delivered uh, confluent pattern and zone two progressively increasing duty cycle and higher power ranges and uh, these are typically applied in a confluent pattern we initially started with you know a standard uh, spot spot size separation but have moved now to confluency because there is no uh, worrisome effect of scar formation at the junctions retinovascular disease particularly uh, RVO and uh, JXT in retinal vein occlusion, both central and branch, we've used micropulse grid patterns generally for dealing with the DME. Uh, again, these are usually uh, done with adjunctive therapy like anti-VEGF agents or triamcinolone. Uh, scatter PRP for neovascularization in the cent central retinal vein occlusion and then sector retinal photocoagulation or phototherapy, I should say, in branch retinal vein occlusion. And for JXT, we generally do a combined focal and grid treatment. So uh, in addition to just treating a, uh, the grid pattern for the uh, macular edema and branch retinal vein occlusion, we would do a sector with a higher setting, uh, more like what we do for zone two in that protocol. And then for uh, CRVO, really either modified PRP uh, for those cases that have gone to neovascularization or, uh, and or the uh, modified uh, uh, grid pattern that we use in conjunction with pharmacotherapy. 
So what has been published? We know so far that MPLT appears to be as effective as continuous wave laser in the treatment of the edema due to branch retinal vein occlusion. Just like in, in, uh, in uh, diabetic retinopathy, it does act more slowly, so that's one of the things that you have to get used to. Uh, the use of intravitreal corticosteroid, particularly before, uh, has shown to not only lead to a rapid resolution of macular edema, but a longer effect, less rebound. We still don't know what the effect would be with combined anti-VEGF uh, uh, treatment to that, but there are studies underway for that. And JXT, uh, and I apologize, I don't have a, a slide to show you that it works very well because we are not restricted by the fovea. And I know some of my colleagues who've used this uh, now, we regularly go through the fovea. And a lot of our colleagues come and ask, you know, about your sanity for doing that because they haven't had the experience yet with that. We've done it hundreds of times where we've gone through with a 5% duty cycle, there's been absolutely no degradation in the pigment or any pattern that you've even given treatment there. And with significant resolution of the leakage. CSR. Uh, there's been some studies already to show that uh, MPLT can enable significantly the reduction of CSR. Now, a lot of, a lot of you, like I was skeptical, said, you can basically blow on the patient's eye and CSR could resolve. But what about the cases that you've already given the time, you've tried pharmacotherapy, and it has, still hasn't resolved? So the effect of just a single session of MPLT was uh, maintained at four months to show that it's durable. Once you get out to that level, chances are at least that initial session has been resolved. Uh, there is, of course, no clinically discernible evidence of the laser-induced uh, pigmentary damage. And in studies, it had been shown to be superior to anti-VEGF. Um, currently, there is a protocol we have already put for a prospective randomized trial and it has just recently got approved by the IRB where we're going to look at the 577 single session for CSR. Um, I think, I don't know how many of you have used PDT for CSR. Is it, can I just show a show of hands? Who has used PDT? Okay. We've moved away from that uh, radically because we can get the same result quicker without the the whole rigmarole of having to do PDT. Here is uh, uh, Andre uh, Maya's uh, case where he's shown a CSR patient, visual acuity on day zero, 20 over 80. Again, single session of uh, micropulse, complete resolution, and uh, day 14. So pretty significant. Here's another case, also uh, 20 over 80, diffuse uh, focal points. And here is uh, the pre-treatment. Here's the post-treatment picture. So pretty significant stuff. And again, it's one of those indications where if you have it, there's no secondary thoughts of I'm going to try something else other than MPLT. And the beauty, as you can see here, here's another pre and post where you have that leakage and it's gone. There's no secondary uh, pigment alterations that you see at this point. AMD. There is a uh, protocol that we have uh, just recently got approved for high-risk uh, AMD uh, that was also approved at uh, GW using the 577. And I know a lot of you are acquainted, you know, there was the CAP trial which showed basically it doesn't work, or at least con continuous wave, even in light application, did not work. However, if you go back and you look at, uh, at the results, uh, we, the micropulse may have an advantage. There have been some few reports to show that it's significant in clearing the drusen. We know that. We've known that for ages that laser can clear the drusen. What's now with the availability of spectral domain OCT, and especially some of the uh, protocols for assessing RPE, geography, and what have you. We can now follow precisely, which they didn't have the advantage in, this, in the CAP uh, trial, of what happens uh, down at that level. And see, does we slow down RPE atrophy? Uh, what happens to uh, um, the retinal sensitivity? All that stuff is going to be interesting. So we're going to hopefully uh, answer some of these questions with this trial. And it will be uh, a slightly modified protocol compared to the CAPT. Obviously, it's going to be using micropulse in a confluent pattern with more controlled uh, spot delivery. Retinopexy. Uh, we get a lot of questions. I get a lot of questions from all over. The say, okay, I've got this micropulse. Have you tried it for retinopexy? Because, well, why would you? You know, some people, they'll say, well, why would you? You can just, you know, crank it up using continuous wave and, and do that. A couple of situations I found particularly interesting and, and useful is if you have, we all know that lattice is not, the pathology is not just right where you see it. There's other areas where the retina is extremely thin and everyone I'm sure in this room who's treated it with a regular laser have popped holes in the area you thought was quote safe. 
right? Even with light treatment, even when you modify. What we found is that with MPLT on those sessions, you can crank it up to a photocoagulative setting, but as you come closer and closer, you can do the MPLT with a 15% duty cycle and get the effects are later evident because you get that pigmentary hyperplasia much less so than you do with uh, um, the, uh, the regular continuous wave delivery, but again, you're not blowing holes in there. So it does have a role. And also, interestingly, surgically, uh, last, this year we reported the first case of the endolaser use of micropulse in a patient who had CMV retinitis, nasty, huge atrophic disease, had a total retinal detachment. So there was, we used it in a section where it was particularly thin. And the nice thing about micropulse is you can actually come pretty close to the tissues so it allows you to manipulate the eye and not worry about either blowing a hole or not treating effectively. A lot of us who use continuous wave uh, mode for uh, retinopexy and a retinal detachment during vitrectomy, we, you know, we can control the intensity by how close you come to the retina. But sometimes you will get those pops. And the nice thing about using MPLT is you can crank up, the, up to 15% duty cycle and come pretty close and it gives you much more of a margin of safety and still get a uh, treatment. Now glaucoma I won't talk about because except to let you know that it's looked at both for cyclophotodestruction as well as uh, uh, laser trabeculoplasty and other speakers who are specialists in this area have spoken on this so that's also being explored. So questions at this point before we just go on to the next section, the last section you'll be happy to hear. Okay how do we use it? I'll share with you my again experience with using MPLT in, in current clinical practice. The holy grail, if you will, is best summarized by achieving the greatest reduction macular thickness, and this is the case of macular edema, in the shortest time and the least amount of side effects and for the greatest duration. Nobody can argue that. That's what the holy grail that we want to all reach with treatment. So integral to that is pharmacotherapy. There is no, the one answer of saying, okay, it's either laser or drugs is a foolish argument. The, the, the truth of the matter, we all use a combination of pharmacotherapy and laser therapy to re achieve that endpoint. So in addition to anti-VEGF agents, we also use, still use corticosteroids. So what are, the, uh, what are the strategies we use? I typically will start uh, for a lot of the macular edema, not all cases, and I'll show you in a second one, that uh, anti-VEGF often require more than three, three injections at least to get a response in, uh, in the majority of cases. Corticosteroids are reserved for those who have marked macular edema and failure to respond to the anti-VEGF agents. However, the caveat, of course, cataracts and glaucoma. Okay. Subthreshold micropulse laser, both focal and grid uh, combinations, you have to explain to them it's not going to be one-stop shopping like we're used to. It's going to take multiple sessions to safely do it and achieve the endpoint. In a lot of cases, you will get to the, to the end point with the one session, as I've showed you, but you have to also explain that to the patient so they're not disappointed after the first session. So the guidelines. Uh, for focal, I still would, can put it in continuous wave. Again, as I mentioned to you, I've moved away from that, and even some of the focal I'm using in micropulse mode. Uh, the grid is micropulse consistently and definitely not a, a non-photocoagulative endpoint. And the nice thing is you can repeat the treatment in 90 to 120 days. So my guidelines, focal, is first is to do a test spot. I usually typically go two disc diameters away from the foveal center and try trade the power up by 20 milliwatt increments until I see a barely visible tissue reaction. Now I'm telling you this because this is the way I started. That's not the way I'm practicing now. Because you've done it enough times, it's, you pretty well know the, session, the settings, and you start from, the, from there. But I would encourage if those who are trying it to first use the test slot uh, method. Grid. Uh, based on the spot, the test spot, I would crank up the power. So the, now the power ranges that I'm using with my settings are 400 to 600 milliwatts. That's still on a 5% duty cycle. Now the important thing is I didn't start out this way. I started as I mentioned, the homeopathic settings with, you know, 100 milliwatts, 200 milliwatts, and start to see, okay, I can crank it up to get the effects. So those are where my parameters are now. How I approach macular edema, both diabetic and retinal vein occlusion related macular edema, is divided into three categories. 
mild, moderate, and severe based on the central mean thickness on OCT. Okay? For mild macular edema, I now have migrated to primary micropulse laser therapy, particularly those that are, have eccentric uh, sources of uh, leak leakage, either juxtafovial or extrafovial. Uh, as I mentioned to you, I do combine focal and grid uh, sessions simultaneously, but again, I'll tell you honestly, 90% of my sessions now are grid, even when there's microaneurysms present. And very selective use of anti-VEGF agents based on secondary uh, characteristics in the retina. For moderate macular edema, again, less than 400 microns, I will typically start with anti-VEGF in, uh, injections of Avastin, uh, Q monthly. Uh, I may continue if I still see a response. And how we define response, at least in our clinic, is, less, is uh, greater than a 20% reduction in the CMT. If I don't see that after three injections, you're gonna get less bang for the buck persisting with anti-VEGF agents. That's not only my experience, but other colleagues. Um, if there is no significant reduction, you have an option to proceed to MPLT, and you can also go back to trying anti-VEGF agents. But generally speaking, the vast majority who have the MPLT a session, if I'm gonna to go to another session, if I'm gonna do another modality or other treatment, it would be with another MPLT session rather than pharmacotherapy. If there is a response to the initial anti-VEGF agent, I mentioned to you, I'll continue that. And again, selective use of the anti-VEGF post-MPLT. For severe macular edema, the juicy ones, the souffles, where they're greater than 400, 420 microns, I will start with three in intravitreal uh, anti-VEGF injections. Again, if there is a response, I will continue up to a maximum of six. My experience has been once, and I, I'll be interested to see your experience as well, once you've read six months of repeated anti-VEGF agents, there's very little more you're going to squeeze out of that macula, okay? at least with anti-VEGF. If at that point the, C, the central subfield mean thickness is still higher than 400 microns, I will then discuss seriously an intravitreal corticosteroid. And again, explaining to them the risks uh, uh, associated with that. And then typically after a month of the injection of either the Kenalog or the Ozerdex, depending if they're a brain, retinal vein occlusion, then I will proceed to MPLT. And that has been the most durable uh, result I've gotten to date ever. Uh, in dealing with uh, macular edema. Uh, if you look at, uh, and this is kind of a summary of some of the anti-VEGF agents versus uh, standard, what we use now, micropulse laser therapy. If you look down at the bottom, the mean number of interventions in one year, okay, you look at this figure versus all the others. And I was discussing with Dr. Mainster, actually just before we started, the way the economy is going, we may not have a choice about what we're going to do. I assure you, the monthly injections of a very high, expensive anti-VEGF agents, that's going to wear out its welcome real soon. So I think if the model comes to where we're given uh, as fixed amount of uh, compensation, say, you deal with the patient as you see effective, we're not going to get into this, this is going to make a difference to how, what, how you approach it. We haven't even discussed the quality. Like, you know, monthly uh, shots in the eye uh, with its antecedent risk I uh, just got off the phone with one of our residents, uh, our former residents, of a patient who, guess what, has a sterile endophthalmitis from uh, our anti-VEGF injections. And that's a real risk. So you put that versus a, a fairly innocuous uh, treatment in terms of side effects, and with that durability, it's a no-brainer. And some of us, you know, it's interesting, we got a discussion with, with the folks at Iridex saying, I don't know if you want to press, there's going to be a lot of unhappy physicians that they're not getting those monthly patient visits, but you know what? I think that time is going to wear out real soon. So, contrary to what's out there, uh, with all the anti-VEGF and the new agents that are being uh, out there, the laser is by far no means dead. It is used more and more. So I hope I added uh, some uh, new information to you and I'll be happy to uh, address questions at this point. Thank you. Are there any questions? Just a moment. Let me pass this off to you so we can all hear. Just to recap, uh, you said you go through, uh, uh, if there is a central thickness in the macula, you go with a laser through, this, through, through, 
Through the phobia. Through the yeah. phobia. That is correct. I know. <laughs> That's the, one of the most common yeah. questions. Yes, I'll say it on the record. We we all do do uh, continue. Uh, we not continue small, but micropulse right through the phobia. The way we actually one of the, the other things that we didn't mention is as you're learning, it's initially it's difficult because you're not seeing. Oh, I put a burn there and I put a burn there. You don't. So you have to kind of in the mental image keep going to using the blood the, the vessels as your landmark to literally paint. The sessions take very little time now because you're on a very high repeat rate. I'm not worried about overlapping of spots because I'm not dealing with photocoagulative uh, effects. So when I come through the fovea, I don't go th back and through it. I go through it once and then continue going, going in the same direction. For the second session, you want to do, suppose uh, the response was not good in the first session right. and you want to do another after three months. Right. Uh, do you d diagrammatically put it in the uh, patient notes or you do fluorescent angiogram? I still, a good point, I still do fluorescein angi angiography uh, to help guide my treatment, but what I I'm, what I'm, would do is still repeat. Now, if there's more microaneurysms that are still leaking, I, that's when I would do focal uh, micropulse on a higher 15% uh, duty cycle still to try to not blanch them, but to treat them, and then do the grid again, the same setting, through the fovea. <laughs> Yes, there's a question. For the treatment of central serous retinopathy, mm -hmm. are, are you treating the RP defect or the whole area of elevation? No, the, uh, it's the RP defect. I started the first sessions treating the whole uh, elevation. Now, one of the interesting things, most of them, as you know, are not just a nice little a bright hot spot. Uh, you can see other RPE defects throughout. I haven't treated those. If there is more than one area lighting up, I would treat those two, but I, I stopped going through the entire RPE deta uh, detachment itself. And would that L go for macular, uh, for macular degeneration as well? You do the no. CNV? We, we haven't, that's a good point, we have not. And in the, the protocol that I described, the high risk is just for high risk dry, non, not wet. Uh, let's go. Oh, Lionel, uh, Lion, Dr. Chisholm has probably commented. <laughs> uh, can you tell me, if, if you have a, a, a central serous with a single leak mm -hmm. and a definite PED, which, which is leaking yeah. at the edge or something like that, right. you go through that whole PED? No. I, I, I used to, and I found that even the ones that I did incompletely treat because uh, for whatever reason that the uh, leak is shut down even with a limited treatment. So I said, forget it. Instead of why do I need to treat that, I just concentrate on the area that's leaking and kind of just over like a daisy, uh, da daisy pattern. But if the whole PED, if, if they, you see you see a PED, a right. blue one, and then the whole thing is right, lighting, oh, lighting, lighting up. up. Yeah, if it's a diffuse, I, you know, very rarely have I seen those that are treated, but usually it's that focal one, or at least in the early phase of the angiogram I concentrate on. But I haven't seen any problems. I'm not seeing any RPE tears, and a lot of my colleagues who've used the uh, micropulse uh, different wavelengths have not, nobody's reported an, an RPE tear with micropulse to, to date. Dr. Bansur, yeah. um, you said that you started using a dose in micropulse mm -hmm. uh, um, using two times the threshold power right. that was determined in continuous right. wave. Yeah. And then, it is, and you called it the homeopathic dose. Yes. <laughs> and then you yeah. say that you progressed yes. to a four times Correct. the very threshold, the same very threshold right. power. Now. I would like to know yes. what uh, really what, what prompted you the, in this. Uh, in this uh, while I know that many other investigators they just uh, reversed. <laughs> really? <laughs> so, yeah, okay. Well, good, good, excellent question. The one thing you, if, to compare apples to apples, you have to look at the duty cycle because I agree with you. There are some who have rolled back, but often it's a 10% or 15% duty cycle. I've completely restricted myself to 5% duty cycle for the macula, and I think kind of that's what Iridex is recommending based on a lot of. Then, at least with that short uh, duty cycle, I, I, I inched forward because I was getting already effects with a 200 micron spot size on continuous wave, 80, uh, 80 milliwatts or what have you, for, for barely visible. So when I cranked it up, multiplied by, four, by two is 160, 200 milliwatts. And I wasn't getting the effect that I said. So people like uh, Victor Chong were reporting, said, and 800 milliwatts, I said, wow. So 
and he showed my signature. So I gradually, over the, the, the year, just increased, increased. So now I'm still happy to be on the bottom side for him because what's the worst? I, I can bring the patient back and retreat. So somewhere between like 400, 600 milliwatts at 5% duty cycle with a large 200 micron spot size. This is large as well. Yeah, I, I, that's why it's, it's easy for me to do. Okay, I guess the second question yeah. is, do you see anything no. <laughs> on, on, on anything. No, you don't see anything during the treatment, nor do you want to. That's the thing. If you see something, you have a problem because you're certainly not going to go through the fovea with, with, uh, with uh, uh, any kind of visible tissue change. So not even at, uh, out, of, uh, uh, at out of fluorescence? No. no. So no. basically, you are very happy to see nothing. I am very happy to see nothing except reduction in the macular thickness and <laughs> improvement in visual acuity. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Could you just go over again that slide uh, where you were treat you that study you're going to be doing be treating in the different zones? Yes. Yeah. That was was that that was for macular edema? Uh, no, that was for that, uh, that was for for PDR. That was for proliferative PD, PDR. Disease. But we were also going to treat through because vast majority either are going to get macular edema or have pre-existing macular edema in those sessions. So let me um, let's see here. Just bear with my navigation skills here through. Here. Okay, so uh, th th I believe this is the, um, you know, I'm still a Windows XP guy, I apologize. <laughs> so can you give me the slideshow on here? All right, uh, th th we divide into three zones. Okay, zone one was from the center of the fovea to halfway to the vortex vein. We wanted to make it simple, visible landmarks. Okay, zone two was from that anterior edge of zone one to the vortex vein or the equator. And then anterior to zone two is zone three. And this is the diagram just shown on the optos of what that area includes. So zone one is also treated, but obviously with a different parameter than zone two and three. And the reason being is, here's, what's the purpose of this? The purpose is to obviously try to get resolution uh, of the PDR with maintaining the largest degree of the, the patient's visual field and dark adaptation and all the other things that we know are adversely affected by continuous wave. And here, these are the settings. These are typically the settings. And uh, to go to Dr. Dorn's question about the settings for this, the way we achieved it is, um, uh, at least submitted, is that you determine the power range on zone one, multiply by two, and then 2.5 for zone three uh, respectively, and increasing the duty cycle. So what happens in reality, you're gonna get something visible. But remember, we're treating confluent. This is a like wall-to-wall -wall treatment. So uh, the, the, we've only had, I mean, I mean I've, been, I've been doing this on our Virginia side practice, and we've seen already there some mild pigmentary changes. Now, I can only tell you about six months out, there's been still regression of the neovascularization and resolution of the edema. But also, we're, the protocol is not saying no. We're only going to do laser. We're not going to do any anti-VEGF or pharmacotherapy. We're allowing for that. The key thing is the duration uh, from treatment to uh, any new vascular activity. Yes, Dr. Oh. Uh, just to make it very clear in my yeah. mind, is this uh, a, a PRP? which is a non-ablative PRP. Mm -hmm. You see that you see something sometimes, right. but the goal of the treatment is right. not... No, in zone one, you don't see any. With these parameters, this is the same identical one. If you look actually at the area, zone one is, is, is pretty large. This is not ETDRS uh, you know, defined uh, regions. So the, the zone two and three, you see, you'll start to see reaction zone two and even more so in zone three. Uh, the idea being, as you pro all know, especially with the wide field and geography more recently, we know that most of the ischemia is where? Most of the ischemia in, in diabetic retinopathy and proliferative is in zone three. All right, so in zone two and zone three. So the idea is if we can treat those tissues, we, we can, if we treat them even with more aggressive therapy, then we get much more durability of the reversal of the or neovascularization. So we don't mind doing a little bit of ablative. And again, it's confluent treatment. The truth is we're doing the study because we don't know. We don't know. We, 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 from what we've seen so far in the pilot, there has been a good response. And this is with the 577. There's been no other study that's shown with the visible. There's been with the A10. 
Uh, but, sorry, mm. and how do you define response? Is regression of the vascularization? Several things, because this is a combination of both the visual acuity due to the edema. As I said, uh, it's even if the P, uh, PDR patient does not have clinically significant macular edema, we're still treating zone one because we know there's a, there is a higher chance that they will develop macular edema from con continuous wave, right? So just to be on the safe side, we're gonna treat that with the parameters and zone two and zone three in a single session. The reason being also, the impetus partly with this, is it's convenient for the patient and the physician. It's one-stop shopping, right? So you can come do the, all three zones and then later either use uh, pharmacotherapy as adjunctive to this. See, this is the, this is the thing. People say, uh, you know, well, why? Because, you know, standard PRP works so well. Of course it works well. So is taking a hot nail and cauterizing the entire retina it works well too. But the goal is not just a regression of neovascularization. You still want to have the patient's visual function in terms of visual field. I mean, all of you know what, what happens to a standard by the book PRP patient. They complain of the constricted visual field. The night vision is lousy. Transition from light to dark environments is horrible. And they keep reminding you and it doesn't go away. It gets worse, Photo, uh, photosensitivity, everything. So you are not casting uh, or producing uh, a, a macular edema if the edema was not there? No, and th that's the other thing too. We ha It's been limited data. If we do zone three and two, which we've done on cases without treating zone one, with molecular pulse, with these settings, there's very, very little change in the macular edema. It doesn't worsen, or it doesn't come, it doesn't initiate it at all. Exactly. That's another exciting thing. Uh, okay. Uh, just last one. Sure. Um, certain uh, uh, investigators report that uh, they do not actually see regression. Ex good point. Uh, my colleague at uh, the university, uh, Lindsay Smith, called me up uh, like a, a couple of months ago. She started using it. She said, Sam, some of these patients are getting worse. I started using microwaves. So I stopped and said, okay, what are your settings? And I told her, you know, a few of my patients, quote, got worse initially when I tried it, and I was using very homeopathic doses of, of micropulse. I don't know, I, I don't have, we don't have enough data to say, is it actually a worsening, or maybe, maybe at those settings and frequencies, you may be causing more leakage, we don't know. But we know for sure, once you bump it up to the, the 400, 600, 800 milliwatts with that two cycle, there's definite regression in the majority of them. So that's why, if I had to go back and start it again, I would do a higher, um, the settings. And my settings, if you look, are pretty conservative compared to, I'm, I'm sure others who have more experience, uh, they're certainly more conservative than the majority. But I have not seen worsening with these parameters. Sorry. Uh, in, in severe non-proliferative uh, retinopathy, can you apply uh, zone one uh, setting for the, non, uh, for the ischemic area according to fluorescein? Yeah, oh, yeah. For, the question is for zone one, uh, proliferative diabetic retinopathy? Uh, no. zone, two or z zone two and zone three. Yes. But uh, um, non proliferative severe ischemia. Right. I want to apply um, zone one to this yeah. uh, uh, setting to this area. Definitely. As a matter of fact, I would argue that more and more micropulse is going to be ind indicated for this particular setting because we know already what happens with continuous wave. It's a no brainer. So if I have a, a large uh, fovea, and as you know, we just came from a session with Sandy, you know, Sandy Brucker on the panel and so forth. Uh, there is a study that's going to address the issue of anti-VEGF agents, whether it worsens capillary dropout or, or uh, it doesn't touch it or makes it better. There's, there's some concern, some people have expressed concerns, especially now that we have the Optos system, that maybe repetitive anti-VEGF agents may not be uh, the cat's meow, if you know what I mean for those patients who are severely ischemic, okay? We don't know yet. So we know for M from micropulse, it doesn't change that one iota, the uh, degree of ischemia. There's also some evidence that it decreases uh, vascular caliber. Right, that's right, yeah. That's right, it's an excellent point. There's, there's also some uh, mm -hmm. evidence that uh, uh, anti-VEGF uh, agents uh, may reduce uh, vascular caliber and blood flow, oh. which is one of the reasons that 
there's some reservations about right. the use in, for example, uh, branch retinal vein occlusions. Yeah. And also, that's a good point, a lot of you are familiar with the report, a lot of you are familiar with the report that came out, I think, a week or two ago from uh, Genentech, that they're looking at the data because there was some concern about uh, cerebrovascular, cardiovascular risks still. So the jury's still out on, on whether, uh, you know, they're perfectly safe to use them. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all. <laughs>